Welcome everyone who has survived the siesta. Uh, let's just take a moment to gather ourselves in, in quiet and silence and take a moment to be present to ourselves. to each other. And to the great uh, community of the tradition that we are exploring in these days. The presence of teachers down the ages pointing towards Christ the teacher within. So yesterday, uh, well, first of all, I'd like to say how very pleased I am to be here. Uh, I think the, uh, the quality of the, present, the talks uh, from, the, from the speakers and also the quality of conversation uh, among all of us and the participants is really, is really very enriching, very, very high. So um, thank you all. Yesterday, I was uh, speaking about the to the wheel of prayer, the opus dei, the vocal prayer of the monks uh, that Benedict spends a lot of time describing in detail, and uh, oratio pura, the goal of the monk in this tradition, which is to come to a state of ceaseless prayer. And um, I uh, lost my page. So uh, that distinction between Opus Dei and the prayer of the heart might reflect something quite radical in the structure of our human consciousness, say the left and the right hemispheres. Modern brain research says that the, uh, these two hemispheres which deal with quite different ways of perception, different kinds of attention, uh, are nevertheless not operating separately. In fact, the latest science is, is that they are both involved in all forms of attention, in all forms of activity that we're involved in. And yet, at the same time, there is a world of difference between these two hemispheres, these two kinds of attention both active, both involved. And I think that is a good, a good uh, metaphor for understanding the relationship between the different forms of prayer. Meditation, this prayer of the heart, this oratio pura, does not uh, replace other forms of prayer. I'd like to speak about John Cassian today. John Cassian uh, <clears throat> is a bridge maybe between left and right hemispheres. He's a bridge between uh, the Eastern Church and the Western Church. Uh, he became a monk and studied and practiced deeply in the Egyptian desert uh, before coming to the West and bringing the wisdom of the desert monks uh, to uh, the Western Church and had a profound influence on the whole of Western spirituality. Cuthbert Butler, the great English Benedictine scholar, said that the conferences of Cassian on prayer, which is what I'll look at uh, today with you, uh, are nothing has been done better uh, in Western spirituality than these two conferences on prayer. He adapted the life and the spirit of the desert to the different environment and circumstances of the early monastic movement as it was developing in southern Europe. This pattern of adaptation and translation is of course at the heart of all tradition. Tradition would die out if it just stayed the same, if it was just 
deep frozen. So tradition is, a, is, a, is like a river that's flowing. It's a passing on. Not a passing on of an experience so much as a passing on, I think, of the, of the container or the receptacles or the, stim the stimulants that allow that experience to awaken in individuals and in communities in different generations. And um, as John Cassian is, and his influence on John Main is why we are here uh, for this week, I think it's reasonable to think that that tradition took another step, another adaptation uh, in, in John Main uh, in, the, uh, in the late 1960s, early 70s. And that was uh, exactly the perception that the great French Benedictine scholar Adelbert de Vogue uh, took in an essay he wrote, an article he wrote in Monastic Studies in 1984, I think, uh, after John Main had died. Uh, I asked him if he'd like to write something, and he said he would like to write on uh, uh, on, on John Main, and he would like, and the title of his essay was From John Cassian to John Main. And, just, and he makes the point that just as Cassian was a bridge between the Eastern and Western churches, so um, John Main sharing in that could also be seen as something of a bridge between the Christian and the non Christian worlds. Anyway, John Cassian was born in what is probably to modern Romania in uh, about the middle of the 4th century and died in Marseille in about 435. Um, he seems to have had a good education. He knew Latin and Greek. And with a friend called Germanus, he left his home <coughs> uh, to make a pilgrimage, we were, Sarah was talking about pilgrimage the other day, to make a pilgrimage to what was probably the, the heart of the, the most vital and dynamic uh, center of Christian spirituality in the Christian world at that time, which was northern Egypt, where the monastic movement was flourishing and, and famous. So he and Germanus, uh, two young pilgrims, monks to be, uh, made their pilgrimage from Romania to, first of all, to Bethlehem. And they joined a monastery in Bethlehem, spent three years there, but found that it wasn't, uh, it wasn't helpful. They were eager for the work of God, as St. Benedict said. Uh, they wanted to grow, they wanted to go deeper, they had a, a hunger for uh, for prayer, for deeper experience, for deeper knowledge of God, for spiritual growth, and they found that it, they weren't getting what they needed uh, in Bethlehem. So they asked uh, for a short leave of absence and uh, went, to, um, went to Egypt. They felt a bit guilty because uh, they never got permission to stay there permanently, but they disobeyed their abbot and, uh, and stayed there for the next uh, 15 years. And then uh, a, a major upheaval took place. We shouldn't be romantic about the early monastic movement. Uh, there was an, a theological upheaval, great controversy, uh, which we'll look at in a moment. And um, in about the year 400, uh, there was a clash, even a violent clash, uh, between uh, the, the different theological left and right hemispheres of the monastic movement. And uh, the monks who followed the teaching of Origen, and that would have included Cassian, who was very much influenced by Origen's theology and spirituality and philosophy, uh, basically had to get out as quickly as they could. So they went to different places, uh, Cassian and Germanus went to Constantinople, took refuge there. Was there? He was ordained as a priest, 
And uh, the rest of his next few years are a little vague. He may have spent some time in Antioch. Uh, he came to Rome on a mission for the Patriarch of Constantinople. And uh, when he was in Rome, he was invited by um, uh, uh, the bishops of southern France to go and establish a monastery uh, there. And so he moved to Marseille and set up a double monastery, uh, the monastery of St. Victor's, uh, for men and women. And there he died in about 415. The local bishop was having some trouble with the monks of the area who were not as disciplined, organized, and respectable as they are today. And uh, the monks were the sort of the wild side of, of life, as they should be, actually. Um, they become domesticated now. But uh, they were a little difficult to control, so the bishop asked uh, Cassian if he could develop a, a theology and an ideology of the monastic life for the nascent uh, monastic movement uh, in that part of Europe, and um, if he could distill and adapt the wisdom, the teachings that he had ab absorbed in Egypt uh, for, uh, for that environment. So his three great works are the Institutes of the Monks, which uh, deal with some very practical issues like clothing and uh, times of prayer, rather similar to, to Benedict's uh, chapters on the, on the uh, divine office, rules of life, um, moral behavior, food, things like that. The institutes uh, were then followed by the conferences of Cassian, which, uh, and we'll look at two of those conferences, or one in particular, on prayer. Uh, there were 24 of these conferences, uh, which were put into the mouths of uh, great teachers of the desert, but uh, they're clearly a, a rather dramatized uh, version of, of, the, uh, of the teaching, but it would have distilled the actual teaching of the, of the desert into these 24 uh, Chapter, uh, it's conferences reflecting the 24 elders in the book of Revelation. And the two, chapter, the two conferences on prayer, 9 and 10, form the structural unity of the conferences. I won't spend too much time talking about the structure of it, but the, these two conferences are the sort of the hinge on which the whole of the conferences depend. He wrote another uh, book on the incarnation, uh, entering into a theological controversy at the time over the place of free will in, and grace, the relationship between the two. And he's generally regarded by theologians as taking a sort of a common ground uh, in the dispute, but uh, he ran into trouble with St. Augustine, who was in Hippo at the time, and uh, you, you don't mess with Augustine. So Augustine uh, argued with him very uh, intensely. Um, but the, the outcome anyway was that, uh, as in, in many cases of, of, of that period, he, he was, he's regarded as a saint, was never formally canonized, but, that's, but recognized as a saint, Cassian, uh, both in the Eastern and Western Church. For a time, he was given the feast day of February the 29th but he has now been elevated to July the 23rd. So he's very clearly uh, a bridge between the Eastern and Western churches. He's quoted at uh, great length in the Philo Philokalia, and of course uh, St. Benedict in the West refers to Cassian and is deeply influenced by Cassian, and as I said yesterday, uh, prescribed the, that Cassian should be read at meals uh, in the monastery every day. So, um, what is Cassian talking about? What I'd like to do is, is look at these two conferences on 
uh, uh, 9 and 10. But let me just give a little background to the main, the main themes uh, of, uh, of Cassian's work and, and vision. His primary interests are how are not speculative or theological in the academic sense. Uh, his main th theme and interest is how to achieve unceasing prayer. He's practical. And purity of heart is the way in which we do that. So he says, the end of every monk and the perfection of his heart incline him to constant and uninterrupted perseverance in prayer. And as much as human frailty allows, it strives after an unchanging and continual tranquility of mind and perpetual purity. So equanimity, the great universal meditative principle of calmness and evenness of mind. In order to do this, and the work of purifying the heart and the emotions, as we saw, was to abandon anxiety. As Jesus says in his teaching, do not worry about what you are to eat, what you are to wear. Uh, these are the things for the heathens to worry about. So abandon anxiety, let go of your worries, and purify the emotions. And he says, this anxiety, letting go of anxiety, has different stages. At first, uh, you let go of anxiety about fleshly matters. So, you know, you've lost your wallet and your... Sorry, I think somebody did lose their wallet, didn't they? So, all right, I won't go into that then. Um, so, all right, <laughs> you, um, you're, you know, you're worried maybe, uh, I don't know, some, something at work uh, that is causing you temporary anxiety and... and becomes a source of distraction at the time of prayer and maybe keeps you awake at night. So he says that you know, this is material anxieties. He's not, he's not saying they're unimportant, he's just quite the reverse. He's saying they are important and they, we have to learn how to lay them aside. But he says you, you, we let go of the anxiety um, and even the memory of affairs and business which we should uh, not allow to enter into our minds at the time of prayer. This is the great principle of guarding the heart. That the first step in coming to continuous prayer is to know what is going on in your mind and your heart and being a kind of immigration officer. So when a, a sus suspicious looking thought or feeling uh, shows you their presence or you know, comes to your booth, you, uh, you, you check them and you say, Why, what, what is this feeling of anger or hatred or jealousy or uh, despair or whatever it is, whatever one of the states of mind that we want to lay aside, to notice it and then uh, and work on it. It's not just noticing it, you also have to work on it in an appropriate way. So, in this way, he says, we begin to let go of all negative uh, contents and attitudes of the mind, the way we detract other people, the way we speak against them, gossip, idle speech, talkativeness, um, fooling around without r real humor just for the sake of it, anger, of course, sadness, uh, lust and avarice, all of these things need to be noticed and uh, uprooted, he says, not just laid aside, but uprooted. Because prayer is the central goal and, uh, and meaning of the monk's life for Cassian, he's, it's very important for him how we prepare for prayer. And he recognizes that whatever our soul is thinking about before the time of prayer will come into our minds when we pray through the operation of memory. And so we must prepare ourselves before the time of prayer 
to be the prayerful person that we wish to be. So the way you live is going to determine the quality of your prayer. The early Christians understood this. We call it spirituality or in a secular sense we call it lifestyle. But the way you live is the way you pray. The way you pray is the way you live. Because the mind in prayer, he says, is shaped by the state that it was previously in. And when we sink into prayer, the image of the same actions, words and thoughts will play it themselves out before our mental uh, eyes. And therefore, before we pray, we should make an effort to cast out from our hearts whatever we do not wish to creep up on us as we pray. And in that way, we can fulfill the injunction, pray without ceasing. So in order to do this, we have to just make some changes in our way of living. And I think most people who meditate will notice fairly quickly that their life begins to change. Because there are things that you may be doing that are inconsistent with what you are doing in the times of meditation. And this may not be dramatically uh, obvious to you at first, but it will be increasingly clear to you that there are certain things that don't harmonize with, the, with your meditation. If you're watching, to put it crudely, if you're watching f four, four or five hours of, of TV every day, uh, you're going to find it difficult to meditate and you'll be well aware that all of that TV watching or web surfing or uh, mindless distraction is uh, interfering with your prayer. So the next point he makes is that life has to be simplified and rather as we as Gilberto uh, said this morning uh, this is the this is the positive meaning of asceticism. So, Cassian, like all the other monks of the desert, is very concerned about how much we eat, uh, how we live, and, uh, and even how we earn our money, because the monks of the desert uh, earn their own living, maybe by working as manual laborers, or making mats, or doing other very simple tasks like that. <clears throat> um, so, he says we have to be very conscious of the simplicity of our life. And I think in a, an age where we've, in, in the light of the new uh, papal encyclical and the uh, environment, clearly this relationship between prayer and simplicity of life is, as, is even more important to us now globally than it was for him spiritually at that time. As he talks about the, and we'll look at this in more detail in a moment, but when he talks about distractions at the time of prayer, uh, as a disciple of Evagrius, he was, he was very conscious, very aware that the work of prayer involved dealing with distractions. And so he recognizes that distractions are inevitable. Uh, but because the mind is inconstant and variable and as light as a feather is an image he uses, it can just be blown away by one thought or another, uh, our prayer is always going to be work, the work of attention. A brother came to Abbot Pastor and said, Many distracting thoughts come into my mind, and I am in danger because of them. So, translate that into someone today. I can't meditate because I'm so distracted. My mind is all over the place. Um, uh, the elder, the Abba, uh, took the monk and pushed him out of the, of the cell into the, into the open air. And he said, open up the garments 
uh, that you're wearing and catch the wind in them. But the monk replied, I cannot do this. And the abbot said to him, if you cannot catch the wind, neither can you prevent distracting thoughts from coming into your head. Your job is to say no to them. It's a very important principle of, 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 uh, of the prayer of the heart that uh, Cassian is teaching in Conference 10. And it's a very important uh, principle for any of us uh, as we learn to meditate. Uh, some of you, I'm sure, have had the uh, experience of uh, arguing about this way of prayer with people who are unfamiliar with it. And maybe from some uh, evangelical or Pentecostal uh, Christians, you will hear that this is dangerous because if you blank out your mind, the devil will come in. And if you're meditating, you'll say, well, who's ever blanked out their mind at the time of meditation? We, are, we live with distractions. The purpose of meditation is not primarily to get rid of all the distractions, it is to lay them aside. The essence of prayer, according to Evagrius in one of his sayings, Prayer is the laying aside of thoughts. Now by prayer here, he means this, this oratio pura, the prayer of the heart. Now, Cassian in the ninth conference uh, is, puts the teaching of the desert on prayer into the mouth of Abba Isaac, one of the great uh, figures of the desert. And in the ninth conference, Abba Isaac uh, speaks about the different forms of prayer. Um, and all of these forms of prayer are valid and all of them are good and appropriate in their own way. The prayer of the heart or pure prayer does not replace the other forms of prayer. And so he says, I urge first of all that supplications, prayers, intercessions and thanksgiving should be made. All these kinds of prayer, which we've spoken about, are helpful and necessary to everyone. So that in one and the same person, um, they will pray in different ways at different times. According to what? Your mood, according to where you are, according to who you're with. And yet, at the same time, think about the two hemispheres of the brain, at the same time, Although we pray in different ways at different times, and all of these different forms of prayer are valid, there is a movement of prayer, a, a direction and a continuum of prayer, which is taking us towards a state of prayer, a purity of prayer, in which we pour out, the soul pours itself out to God wordlessly. Cassian calls this, or Abba Isaac calls this, the prayer of fire. And it's, uh, it corresponds to John Main's uh, theology of Christian meditation when he says all prayer in the Christian understanding is a way of entering into the prayer of Jesus. There is, for the Christian, he says, only one prayer. That is, the prayer of Christ, the mind of Christ, which is within us. This is what St. Paul says uh, when he says, we do not know how to pray, but the Spirit prays within us deeper than words. So we have, we have to uh, it's not either or, and uh, we can pray in different ways at different times, and we can therefore enjoy a really charismatic freedom in prayer, in the form of prayer that you feel appropriate on particular occasions. But at the same time, there is this uh, d deep movement of, of progress or of a, a pilgrimage of an inner journey going in a certain direction, uh, taking us into the prayer of Christ. And this is reflected, I think, in 
fundamental Christian theology of prayer, which is that all prayer is moving towards contemplation. Contemplation is the, the goal of life. So the ultimate way of prayer is to enter wordlessly into that prayer of, of, uh, of Jesus, of the Lord himself. Now I just want to, if I can find it, beautiful passage here which um, describes this state of continuous prayer. This is actually from Conference 10. I think. For then will, there will be perfectly fulfilled in us that prayer of our Savior in which he prayed for his disciples to the Father saying that the love with which you loved me may be in them and they may be in us that they may all be one as you father in me and I in you may they also be one in us when that perfect love of God with which he first loved us has passed into the feelings of our heart and by the fulfillment of this prayer of the Lord which we believe cannot be ineffectual. In other words, if Jesus prayed for it to happen, it will happen. And this will come to pass. So this will actually become a reality for us when God shall be all our love and every desire and wish and effort, every thought of ours and all our life and words and breath and that unity which exists between the Father and the Son and the Son and the Father has been released, shed abroad, he says, in our hearts and minds. So that as he loves us with a pure and sincere and indissoluble love, so we will be joined to him by a permanent and inseparable movement of love. Since we are united to him, in a way that whatever we breathe or think or speak is God. Whatever we think, breathe or say is God. Because we have come to that goal which the Lord in his prayer hopes may be fulfilled in us, that they all may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they also may be made perfect in oneness and that those whom you have given me, I will that where I am, they may also be with me. So this is the theology of prayer that Cassian is passionately uh, committed to in his practice. This is why he wants to come to continuous prayer. So he says, this ought to be the destination of the monk. This should be his whole purpose, so that he can possess, even in the body, an experience of this future bliss. In the body, as, as we heard this morning. And that he may begin in this world to have a taste, a foretaste, of that life of, in heaven and that glory of the fullness of life. This is the end of all perfection. And that, so that the mind, freed or purged from all carnal desires, may each day be lifted towards, more highly towards spiritual reality, until the whole life and, the whole, and all the thoughts of the heart become one continuous prayer. So that's pretty clear, I think, what he means by continuous prayer. It's a total transformation. It is uh, in, in, the, uh, in the tradition of, of, of prayer, there are three stages. There's the stage of kenosis, of the purgative way, of the purifying of the mind and heart, the emotions and desires, 
the emptying out, the purification, uh, the hard work. But then that uh, changes into the second stage of illumination or henosis, where the experience of union becomes more and more intense, more and more uh, delightful. And then finally, uh, the, the goal, as he calls it, the end of all perfection, is theosis, divinization, where we come to share fully in the life of God, that unity uh, with, of, with Jesus that shares in his union with the Father. So, the theology behind what uh, it, it, we see in Cassian on prayer is a very Trinitarian and a very Christocentric uh, theology. And if you want to see that reflected in John Main, read Word into Silence. His book, Word into Silence. So, in Conference 9, he, he speaks about uh, these different aspects of prayer and the final goal of prayer. And Cassian and his friend Germanus are really thrilled by this. This is a great uh, talk they've received and they feel really uplifted and they've, their minds have been opened and they've been given enthousi enthusiastic. The, the eagerness for the work of God has, uh, has increased. So they go back to their cells and uh, then Conference 10 opens, also by Abba Isaac. And Conference 10 opens in a curious way by describing the anthropomorphic heresy of the desert which led to this bust up uh, of the monks and the, the breaking of the, of, of the uh, monastic movement at that point and also to Cassian bringing the desert tradition to the West. The anthropomorphic heresy, as Cassian describes it, and he doesn't describe it entirely historically, but uh, he's, he's, he's uh, making his point, <coughs> uh, began or, or, or took this dramatic turn when the bishop uh, of the place um, issued a letter condemning the anthropomorphic heresy, which was, he describes it as the heresy of thinking that we can see and imagine God in human, in, in, uh, merely in human terms. He doesn't go into a lot of description about this, but that's what he, what he says. And clearly, uh, it was a very hot theological topic. And what actually happened, it seems, was that the bishop, Theophilus, um, wrote this letter taking the side of the originist monks, the monks who would have been teaching pure prayer in this way, and, um, and telling the, what he, would, what he called, the, the, well, the, the less developed uh, monks or the, the, the ones who were still hanging on to, to what he referred to as, uh, you know, well, a less transcendent form of understanding of prayer, let's say. Um, but then the anthropomorphic monks turned against him in, in a big way and in a passionate way. And if you've ever seen the uh, videos of the monks in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre at Easter fighting each other, um, just look it up one day when you want a good dose of uh, re realism about religion. So this uh, probably was what was happening. And, uh, and Theophilus actually changed sides. Cassian doesn't say that, but that's what actually happened. So, uh, he begins by talking about uh, the anthropomorphic heresy, and he mentions uh, the story of Abbot Serapion, 
Abbot Serapium was one that was a good old monk, but still held, he says, in the grip of this anthropomorphic um, state of prayer. And he was a sincere and a good and holy monk, uh, and he was open to discussion with some of the other monks who were talking about this pure prayer, and eventually he was persuaded. It, he, he, he said, okay, I, I, I agree, I see what you mean, and I'll pray in this way. So they were praying together in this way, Abbot Serapion and these originous monks. <clears throat> and then in the middle of the prayer, in the middle of the meditation, Abbot Serapion collapses on the ground in a flood of tears. And he says, he cries out, they have taken my God away from me, and I do not know who to pray to anymore. Now, it's a beautiful, touching, poignant moment, and a very expressive one of what we feel. This is actually very similar to what St. John of the Cross describes in the uh, beginning of the Dark Night of the Soul, where he describes the, the, the night of the senses when we have to wean ourselves off uh, certain familiar and consoling types of prayer in order to go deeper. And there will be times where we feel we're losing God or we're losing familiar kinds of prayer. And anyone who's started to meditate uh, while practicing and enriching and consoling other forms of prayer may recognize this experience. So then this bring, brings Cassian back. So he's, that's a very significant little story he drops in there. He understands what it's like. He understands the personal experience of learning to move into, towards this goal of continuous prayer through purity of heart. So then he comes back to the uh, discussion with uh, Cassian and Germanus. And now Germana says to him, you know, you gave us a great lecture, a great talk on prayer yesterday, and uh, we were really excited by that. But you know, you didn't tell us how to do it. What, how are we going to do this? Because our experience of prayer is one of endless distraction and confusion and all of these negative states of mind that you're talking about. Uh, we are overwhelmed by them. We can't control them. So if we sit there, we, we're just continually failing. We don't know what to do. Now, Abbot Isaac responds by saying, I'm very glad that you've raised that question because you are next door to understanding when you know what question to ask. Now, that is also a very interesting way of putting it. That in other words, he can teach them how to come to this state of, of pure prayer um, if they are ready, if they're asking, if they want it, and if they're ready for it. Otherwise, he's not going to push it on them. And this is a, this is a, this is a feature of the teaching of this uh, understanding of prayer down the ages. There is a tension deeply present, it's not a contradiction, but it's a tension deeply present within Christian spirituality uh, over on this topic. So those of you who have sometimes gone to your parish priest and said, I'd like to start a meditation group, please, and uh, he says, no, absolutely not. Um, I don't know what this is, but it's not Christian. Uh, you know, there's, a, there's, there's, there's some connection to that. So, uh, Abbot Isaac goes on to say, I will now share with you a way, a method, of coming to continuous prayer that was taught by the oldest monks of the desert who themselves received it from the apostolic fathers. So just as you might say to your parish priest, well, actually, Father, this is a very ancient tradition of prayer. So even then, 
<laughs> Abbot Isaac is sort of uh, contextualizing this radically simple and challenging way of prayer uh, by placing it in a historical and theological tradition. Things haven't changed that much and I don't know whether they will ever change that much. So that's what he says. And then uh, what does he do? He then uh, describes the, uh, the method of how to lay aside your thoughts. Uh, he recommends uh, a particular verse of the Psalms which should be repeated continuously. Pondering it, reciting it, saying it continuously in the heart. And he says, um, he calls this in Latin a formula. Uh, it clearly is what John Main refers to as the meditation word or the cloud of unknowing, the little, one little word or the mantra or in centering prayer we call the um, sacred word. So the formula by which the mind can hold itself to this work of purification, of pure attention. And the particular verse he gives, and of course throughout the tradition different schools uh, have recommended different mantras or different formulas. The one that he recommends is, O oh God, come to my assistance, O oh Lord, make haste to help me. That was Cassian's mantra. And interestingly, we, are, we repeat Cassian's mantra at every celebration of the Divine Office, of the Opus Dei. We can see a very strong, obvious connection here uh, between this prayer of the heart and this other form of prayer that's very important to, to, to Benedict. <clears throat> now, what does he say about the mantra, about the, prayer, the, the, the formula? Let me just read you a little bit. This then is the formula which the mind should unceasingly cling to until strengthened by the constant use of it in continual meditation, it casts off and renounces the rich and full material of all kinds of thoughts and restricts itself to the poverty of this one verse. By the constant repetition of this single verse, we renounce the rich and ample matter of all kinds of thought. And so we arrive, he says, with ready ease. So in other words, we come very directly into the experience of that first beatitude. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So he has put his cards on the table. He says, this is how I do it. This is what I would recommend in answer to your question. And this is the way, in his experience and in the tradition, to that poverty of spirit. So what are you doing when you say the mantra? You are renouncing thought and coming into poverty of spirit. And so, one who becomes grandly poor, it's a very interesting word, grandly, if a phrase, grandly poor, by a poverty of this kind, will fulfill the saying of the prophet, the poor and the needy shall praise the name of the Lord. And then he says, and indeed, what greater or holier poverty can there be than that of the person who knows that he has no defense and no strength of his own and asks for daily help from another's goodness? And as he is aware 
that every single moment of his life depends on divine assistance and cries to God in daily in prayer. There then follows uh, a long section in which uh, Cassian describes the many states of mind, or some of the many states of mind, that uh, we pass through as we practice this pure prayer, or this way into pure prayer. And uh, he says, sometimes you're going to really have a great meditation, you're going to feel absolutely floating in heaven and peaceful. Other times you will feel uh, totally bombarded by negative thoughts, uh, you'll feel a complete failure, you know, you'll feel even that God has rejected you, or maybe God isn't even there. So you will go through many states of mind, and the whole great deal of Western mystical theology uh, could be said to begin at this point because it describes these different stages uh, and states of the uh, inner journey. And in response to each of these states of mind, Cass uh, uh, Abbot Isaac says, return to your word, because return to your formula. Because in times of prosperity, you don't want to get complacent. You don't want to try to possess the experience because the goal is to become poor in spirit and to possess nothing. And similarly, uh, when your meditation is terrible and, and distracted and dry and empty, continue as best you can, of course, to repeat your formula because uh, you need it then. You need it to get through. Uh, this, this little bit of a dark night. So, Abbot Isaac says, repeat the formula in prosperity and in adversity. He says that this formula embraces all the feelings that the heart could engender. Very important point that. In other words, the, the formula, the mantra, is bringing you to a singular point of, of total personal unity and simplicity. Nothing in you is wasted. Nothing in you is rejected. Nothing in you can be repressed. Everything has to be put into the blender. And that's what the formula does. It brings together every real or potential state of mind, emotion, memory, and so on. So it is a radically simple work of unification. And yet, this is not a cold and clinical operation. He says the formula recited in this faith contains the glow of love contains the glow of love and this glow of love is reflected in the humility of the prayer itself there's nothing more humbling as we many of us know than saying the mantra then he says turn now remember he's living in in the uh, Egyptian desert not uh, in a modern city with a, a modern lifestyle and, and uh, other dis demands upon us. So he says, recite like in the way of the pilgrim the, uh, and the teaching of the Hesychast uh, tradition uh, which developed later, which uh, Father Joseph will speak about. Um, he says, Repeat this verse continually in your breast. Doesn't, I think he doesn't say heart here, he says in your breast, so it's kind of quite physical, without ceasing. When you're working, whatever kind of work you're doing, when you're traveling, when you're going to bed, when you're going to the toilet, 
uh, repeat this saving formula which will both protect and purify you as you go to sleep, when you awake, and you will find, as some of you may have done, that you repeat it even in your sleep. Rather, like Gulbeto was saying about, uh, you know, um, the asceticism of sleep. This is the, this is the, the, uh, an ascetical tool for Cassian. This is the heart and, and, uh, of the ascetical practice, the prayer of the heart. And this is why John Main says, 100% in this tradition, says um, the essential asasis of the Christian life is prayer. If, you, if we can understand the asasis, well, first of all, what asasis means, and we can understand the asasis of this prayer of the heart, then we have understood this whole tradition. So what does uh, Cassian say is going to, uh, so, so Cassian and Germanus say, oh, thank you, that's what we were waiting for. Now we know what to do. So they go off uh, with their mantra. And then Cassian says, actually, we discovered we were so happy to hear this because it was so simple, so direct, and it made sense. But it was much harder than we thought it was going to be. However, who hasn't found that? However, we began to see the fruits of this prayer quickly, and especially we saw it in the way we read the scriptures that the scriptures were thrown open to us with a new clarity we had never known before. We got to the meaning of these scriptures through experience, through our own personal experience, not through second-hand reflection. So clearly, the first, and you know, these, these were monks who had learned the scriptures off by heart. They probably had certainly the first thing they would have done was to memorize the Psalms and the New Testament. And many of them had the Bible off by heart as well. So these were people who were immersed in Scripture. And uh, so the first thing that they found reflected the, uh, the, the fruits of their meditation in this way was uh, their way of reading Scripture. And then he ends by saying, um, and I'll end with this. So Abbot Isaac uh, brought to a conclusion his second conference on the meaning of prayer, and we were astonished. Uh, he gave this to us as a kind of outline for beginners. What's very important uh, to remember is just as Benedict says that his rule is a little rule for beginners, elementary school, so Cassian says this is a, an elementary simple practice for beginners in the, in the, in, for the inner journey or the spiritual journey. He emphasizes the simplicity of it the childlikeness of it. He says it's like a child learning the alphabet. We have to learn it, but they have to learn it by continually repeating how to draw the, the, the letters. That's, this, is the, this is the image and the, the, the spirit he uses to describe meditation. Compare that with John Main's insistence of the simplicity of meditation. Simplicity isn't easy, but it is simple. And meditate with children in any of the 29 countries in the world where we're teaching them at the moment, and that meaning of childlike simplicity will become very uh, visible to you. So Cassian says, we were, really, uh, we were really admired, we were delighted, and we wished to follow as closely as we could this short and 
Here it says easy, I don't know if that's the right translation, but certainly the short and simple method. But we have found it harder to do than the way we used to read and pray uh, before. But, he says, it is certain that no one is kept away from perfection of heart by not being able to read. In other words, you could be the most illiterate person in the world. And St. Benedict didn't like, he wanted his monks to be able to read. But even if you didn't read, and probably most, of, the vast majority of the monks of the desert would have been illiterate, um, even if you're illiterate, you are not kept away from perfection of heart, this purity of heart, uh, which lies close at hand for everyone, if only they will, by constant recitation of this verse, of this formula, keep the thoughts of the mind safe and sound towards God. So to keep our whole consciousness turned in this direction. So when he says that, it's difficult not to remember the words of Jesus in his teaching on prayer. Set your mind on God's kingdom before everything else and everything else will come to you in due course. So this is Cassian. This is Cassian. He, there's, there's a lot more to Cassian. Uh, as a psychologist, uh, as an uh, observer of the, of the inner journey uh, of, and of his systemization of the states of mind that we have to deal with and of the ascetical path. But he puts these two conferences on prayer as the hinge at the center of his great work for, I think, a very good reason. Because for him, all of this is not about speculation or theory, it's about uh, praxis. And when Germanus asked that simple question of Abba Isaac, okay, but how do we do it? That's what Cassian is repeating to us today, and it's what John Main heard when he was in St. Anselm's Monastery School in Washington, D.C. 1969, and he, he, uh, he came back to meditation uh, by reading Cassian at that moment, a rather strong moment in his life, and then came to the insight that this was a, a method, a way of prayer embedded in our monastic tradition, which could be and needed to be shared uh, with, the whole, with the whole church. And uh, that's why we're here.